for the NAS NASCOM Technology and Leadership Forum, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi was a speaker for um, pro Product Conclave. I think we had over 20,000 attendees for, uh, 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 we've done multiple events that have had like 30,000, 40,000 plus attendees. So the scale is definitely on the larger side. So. Basically, that uh, attendee uh, was was saying, you know, as a, a virtual participant, I pretty much feel like a second class citizen. There's not really an event aspect to this. So how is this any different from me watching that speaker on YouTube or just watching the video later? Why do I need to block time in my calendar to watch a video in a web page? And that that kind of really stood out to us. And uh, as Bharat was talking to me about the problems that he was seeing uh, with these types of events and when they were executing that and hearing that feedback from attendees, that's kind of what got us thinking about uh, you know, what could we do to make this experience better? And what could we do to make sure that that divide between the experience of the virtual attendee and the experience of the in-person attendee was bridged as much as possible? For example, Q&A. A lot of platforms, when they say, you know, they're ready for hybrid, what that means is we have a physical event, we're going to stream that to the virtual audience, and that has this like 15 to 30 second RTMP delay. But now if as a virtual participant, I want to ask a speaker a question. Now, by the time I ask a question, the speaker has already moved on and said some other things. So it's not as easy in that conventional way to have an interactive conversation between virtual participants and in-person participants. And so, you know, we've, uh, the way we approach that, we've done things differently. And the way we, um, you know, do hybrid events is with less than a second of delay, keeping in mind that we always want a virtual attendee to be able to, you know, jump in and we pull up their feed on screen and they ask a question and the speaker can answer right away, just as, you know, you would do kind of like hand over the mic to someone in person and they're able to ask a question to the speaker. We don't want it to seem that, you know, because you're a virtual attendee or you can no longer be uh, a contributor to the content of the event. Something that he would hear in every event brief that they would get as an event agency was, you know, what do we do to make this event unique and memorable, right? And as we were looking at the spectrum of solutions for virtual events, it felt like you were always making a trade-off between things being memorable and things being engaging for your audience. So if things were engaging for your audience, that some of these like new age platforms that had a lot of these interactive features, but because they came with like the SaaS platform aspect of it, it was really hard to make them look different event to event. And then you had some of these older legacy players, um, which were very, I would say, service led. It's not that easy to set it up yourself. You have, you have, you have like the six to eight weeks of lead time that you need to give them with all of your event requirements. And they kind of set up your event site for you, which is yeah a little bit more service driven. And what that would get you is something that really looks like your event from a branding and storytelling aspect. But then because of this like service-led approach, one, you lose control over the process. And then two, you're not able to make it as interactive as some of these new age platforms. And because we were off the bat starting off, we were really going after the, uh, the enterprise space, given that you know that's what Phoenix worked with and that's what we had insight into what uh, those kind, what that audience uh, was looking for in an event solution. Um, we knew that, you know, that unique aspect of it was really important. And we didn't want people to make that trade off between, okay, do, do I want my story to be the forefront and creativity and look like my event? Or do I want to engage my attendees? And so Zuttle sits really in the middle of those two types of platforms and lets you build out a really custom looking event all by yourself. You don't you obviously, we give you support, but you don't need to rely on somebody external while also having the capability to engage your attendees. And had we not had that insight that, you know, that aspect is really, really important to enterprise events, we probably would have gone the route of a lot of these other platforms where events look uh, really similar event to event. So I, I think that aspect is one of it. And then the other thing is thinking about the actual show run and the execution of the event during the event in itself. Um, I think with Zuttle, there's a lot of features that we have that make it a lot more seamless. 
to have all of your speakers and attendees in the same place and for the person running the show to easily uh, manage their entire show flow. And again, these are insights that, you know, companies take months to build, uh, you know, like empathy for their customers and really get to understand their customers. And because Bharat and some of our early employees came from Phoenix, they lived and breathed that life for seven years. So, you know, we were miles ahead in terms of just starting off the bat. We had that empathy for our customer because they were the customer. And just living in that space, we were able to make certain decisions about how you would run the show. How do you make that a stress-free experience um, and, and really weave that theme into the product throughout. Because yeah, I think if you talk to event people who run events, the it, physical events are notorious for like being very stressful and chaotic. And people would say that they have one of the most stressful jobs and bringing that into the virtual realm kind of just that made that even more stressful because it's the same stakes, but now you have people in all of these different places. So you can't just like all huddle together and fix the problem. You don't know what's happening with the speaker's internet somewhere, some attendee somewhere and so on and so forth. So you kind of just made that stressful experience even more stressful. And because events is uh, unlike other, you know, SaaS type of spaces, it's very high stakes, right? Each event only happens once. So you, there, there's no do over, you don't get to do the event again. You gotta get it right when you're doing it this time. And so because of that high stakes nature, whatever we can do to make that actual show run experience in itself better is, uh, it was also a really important theme for us to weave uh, throughout all of the features that we built from the get go. It forced everyone to push the boundaries on what you could do uh, with digital and virtual. And uh, people who were uh, apprehensive before or skeptical before kind of didn't have an option through the last 18 months. And so everyone was forced into this experiment. And then now you visibly see the benefits. And so that's influencing strategy, you know, post pandemic as well, because people can see that, you know, I think the two big things with uh, virtual are one, the scale and reach that you can get, not just in terms of the, not just reach in terms of attendees, like obviously you can reach global attendees, you aren't bound by this physical location, but also in terms of access to speakers, right? Like now I can run an event sitting out of India and get the best speakers from anywhere in the world. And I don't have to worry about all of the logistics of that or convincing a speaker that it's worth their time to make that travel. And that kind of levels the playing field and the quality of the content that you're able to uh, deliver regardless of geography. So reach both from an attendee standpoint and also from a speaker access standpoint. And then also data, like events are, physical events are notorious for, you know, bad data. There's this magical element to this. There's this intangible that you can somewhat sense like, oh, there's buzz about this event afterwards. And, but you can't really, um, it's hard to quantify how exactly how, you know, att what an attendee did and how that tied into behavior later. And over the last 18 months, people were able to do that with insights on, you know, people's attendee journey throughout their events and how that tied into their behavior afterwards. And So I think some challenges are going to be one is now that people are hungry for the data that they get with virtual events, you know, how can you push the boundaries of what you can provide for the in person attendees, and how are you going to instrument that to make sure that you give valuable insights for both virtual and uh, in person. So that's one aspect. And then the other is, you know, pushing the boundaries of interactions between uh, in-person and virtual attendees. So it shouldn't just be that, you know, virtual attendees get to interact with each other and then in-person attendees get to interact with each other. How are you gonna make it really feel like one event that everyone is at, even if they're all attending from different places? So continuing to push the boundaries on that. So those are gonna be two really important themes. It's a fascinating story actually, and uh, I know you guys are growing very fast. Um, so so it, once again, thank you for your time. I think it's been a very enriching conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sanjay, and thanks for being a part of our journey.